my opinion. Yes, I agree. So in order for us to get that, the Lions would have to beat the 49ers, which is the other game happening tomorrow. So this one I called grit versus glam because that's kind of what it feels like. You've got Dan Campbell, bite your kneecaps off, and you've got Kyle Shanahan who does things in the most glamorous way in terms of the offense and the way everything works for them. But it's interesting because this is a battle of game managers, as Cam Newton would say. So on one side in the AFC, you've got these two dynamic quarterbacks who lead their offenses. On the other side, a lot of people feel like Brock Purdy and Jared Goff are game managers. But both of these guys had outstanding seasons this year, and the offenses look to them to lead them. So I think it's interesting how different all of the NFC is when the NFC, I think, historically probably is more, I don't know, more toward the 49ers. You think about the West Coast offense and all of those glamorous teams that were chucking the ball up, and now you've got Dan Campbell and his boys coming in, and they're they're out for blood, man. And you know what? I'm not going to lie to you. The way that the 49ers played without Debo Samuel, if he does not play, I think the, the Lions have a real legitimate shot of punching the 49ers in the mouth because the Packers almost did. <laughs> for sure. I mean, and I kind of was thinking about this last night. I'm like, you know, it's kind of like the engineer versus the mechanic, you know, and uh, from a coaching matchup perspective. And that's probably not giving Dan Campbell the credit he deserves, but I think it was just an interesting analogy, you know, kind of blue collar versus white collar, all those other terms you could throw out there that would that would fit that uh, narrative. It, I think everyone has been waiting for the lions to finally you know for their flame to burn out and uh i i you're gonna have to i just like you're gonna have to kill them right to make them go away i mean they're just they're they are they're so gritty and we throw that word around here kind of you know tongue in cheek a lot but like they are the embodiment of just toughness and i think that you're gonna have to just they're gonna have to become incapacitated uh, for for you to find a way to beat them, and and I don't know if a team like the 49ers, I mean, obviously they're highly, they're very talented, well coached, but so are the Lions. And but I don't know if the I don't know if the 49ers mentally are willing to do the things that the Lions are willing to do to win this football game. Uh, and I I can't like define that for you necessarily beyond that, but it's. You know, you know what I mean? There's some people out there, like there's a guy, there's a guy that was a wrestling coach. I know he had, he has a background like in the MMA. He had a, 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 you know, a brief moment in the UFC, but he, he's gotten, he's an older guy now and he's a weird dude, but he's tough as nails. And I've always said, like, if you were ever going to fight him in like a fist fight, you would have to kill him because he would never quit like ever. And I think that, that's how I feel about the Lions. Like they're they're not going to quit. They're not going to back down. And uh, I'm again fully on the bandwagon. If ever there were a difference in teams, I think you see it here. And the thing about the Lions that I think is not only endearing right now, but I think makes them even more dangerous is how much they are playing for their coach and playing for each other. I'm not saying the 49ers aren't playing for Kyle Shanahan, but Dan Campbell to me seems like the kind of guy that you'd go out and have a beer with. I don't get that sense about Kyle Shanahan. I get the sense that you go wine tasting with him, which is a lot more boring than going out to the local pub. But Dan Campbell also was on the 0-16 team, and that means something. By the way, did you see the stat that the Lions have had an 0-16 team and made the conference championship in this century, and the Cowboys haven't done the, haven't gone to the conference championship this century, which is just fantastic? <laughs> I love how all the stats are just like sticking it to the Cowboys because you see a lot that are like that. But Dan Campbell being on that 0-16 team, I saw I read an article today that that 0-16 team is sort of emotionally attached to this Lions team because of Dan Campbell. So he's not just like, – what he does in his public persona is not – he's not playing a role. That's who he is. And that authenticity is palpable and it's magnetic – and I think the players are playing for him in a way that is different than Kyle Shanahan. I think that the 49ers are so talented that they are here because of the fact that they are so talented. And this Lions team has had to build the last three years under Dan Campbell to get here. Both of their games were dogfights, so they're ready. 
And that, it's exactly like you said. They're not gonna. They're not gonna back down. They're not gonna be afraid. The home field advantage is not going to matter. Dan Campbell's gonna have them ready to go. And that mentality of just always going into deep water and never being able to fully take them out. I think sometimes teams like the 49ers who are much more finesse have a hard time dealing with that when the chips are really down. So if the Lions are in this game in the fourth quarter, it's going to be moxie time for the 49ers. And I'm going to say this because I think it's true. Kyle Shanahan has not really performed well in the biggest of games. If you look at his entire coaching career, that loss to the Patriots, losing in conference championship games, and that stat from last week that you were just, you and I were blown away with. Now, after winning that game against the Packers, he's 1-30 in all time when his team is down by seven or more points in the fourth quarter or something like that. And it's like, that's shocking because for a guy that everybody labels a genius, not a lot of winning when the chips are down, in my opinion. You're right. And I mean, some of it obviously is his pedigree. Um, his dad obviously being a Super Bowl winning coach. And he's coached on a lot of good coaching staffs under other great coaches. And he's had success as a head coach, just not and even as a coordinator, but hasn't been able to get over the hump and win the big game. I don't know if now if they lose this one, then I think that you can really slap that label on him for sure at that point in time because you know you're at home. You know you you have the better roster even without Debo Samuel. I mean you, you a lot of you know a lot of the boxes are checked in your favor going into this football game. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get the best shot from the Lions, but I think that if things don't go their way, you can absolutely start to. You know, that narrative is going to get louder and louder. It will be it will be interesting though because you know, was it Santa Clara? That's where the stadium is, right? Yes, if I'm not mistaken. And like Santa Clara, California, does not scream home field advantage to me. You know, when you no. think of some of these stadiums we've seen games at Arrowhead, you know, Bills Mafia in Buffalo, you know, Detroit, and Santa Clara. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just yeah. it doesn't fit with the others, and so. Like you said, there really isn't going to be much of a home field advantage there either. But uh, yeah, I don't like what is what's Kyle Shanahan's future look like if this doesn't go well? I mean, his job's not on the line by any means. No, but, you know, is does this really start to define him if things don't go in their favor? But remember, when we talked about McCarthy and we talked about Sirianni, you made the point a couple of times about is there something that this person is bringing to the table that's not getting it done? And if Shanahan gets to the conference title game again and doesn't make the Super Bowl again, it is 100% fair, in my opinion, to throw that label on him and ask the question of, can this guy get it done in the biggest of games? We did it to Lamar Jackson. We we did. Fairly, fairly or unfairly, we did it to Lamar Jackson and said, oh, we can't win the big one. Peyton Manning couldn't win the big one. Name any guy over the course of time who's come in with a lot of hype and not been able to get it done in the biggest of games for a while. Shanahan has some stinkers on his resume. And yes, I think he did bring them to the Super Bowl with Jimmy G once, right? Was that in 2020? Was he the coach then? Or was that that? I'm not sure. I can't remember. Now. That was Shanahan. I'm was sure. it Shanahan? So I, I'm just saying, like, have they, the question of have they peaked with Kyle Shanahan is valid. But I think also the upside that he brings is too hard to ignore. Like, if you were going to look at both of these guys and say, which one would you keep with, cap 12 win seasons mike or mike mccarthy or kyle shanahan like 100 percent of the people are keeping shanahan right because of all the dynamicness that he's bringing i'm not saying he should get fired i'm not saying they're gonna think about it but the legacy question comes into play because it's only fair well mccarthy has a much longer track record of just mid. being slightly above average, you know. <laughs> uh, mid, just say it, damn it. Yeah. Well, I want to give him more credit than that. No, the guys won a lot of football games. It's because yeah, it will be. It, yeah, it will be. It will be interesting. Now, here's a question for you. Yes. If the 49ers happen to win the Super Bowl, does that diminish the value or start to diminish the value of quarterbacks of these big time quarterbacks? Does that prove that you don't need a top ten? quarterback to win the Super Bowl. It, it mean, in my opinion, it means one of two things. It either means that, that you don't need a top 10 quarterback to win the Super Bowl, or that everyone in America missed on Brock Purdy completely. So I think it's somewhere in the middle because look at the quarterbacks remaining in this draft, or excuse me, in this field. 
Jared Goff, first round pick. Patrick Mahomes, first round pick. Lamar Jackson, first round pick. Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant. So it's not as if first round guys don't make it. I think that what it shows is that number one, quarterback evaluation is as flawed as it's ever been because it's hard to do this. And there's really no, there's no way of knowing. I mean, this week alone, Colin Cowherd has been raked over the coals for his rant about Lamar Jackson not being a quarterback in this league. Obviously, that was wrong. And so we don't really know. But think about all the guys that have been picked in the first round that haven't panned out. It's never been an exact science. I also think that it means that you can have a quarterback that other people don't see as as talented, but also put a crap ton of talent around them and that'll win you some football games. A lot of it comes down to, do you have the right guy with the right players? If Brock Purdy was on any other crappy team, right? If Brock Purdy was a bear, the bears probably would be as bad, if not worse than what they are because they don't have anybody else. So would he be able to elevate them? Not sure. Would he have been, Would what would the Patriots have looked like if Brock Purdy was a quarterback and not Mac Jones? They probably would have won more than four games, but how many more? Because name a Patriots receiver. I'll wait. So, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, that's why I think it's not definitive. But I think the only thing that it is definitive about it is that quarterback evaluation is just flawed. And we have to accept it. It's a crapshoot when you pick a quarterback in the first round period. How many How many starting quarterbacks? And, and I don't mean, like, who finished the year starting. I mean, like, actual, like, consider the franchise quarterback that aren't first round draft picks. Dak Prescott was a third rounder, I think because he was drafted again in a, in a weird situation where didn't have to start right away because they had Tony Romo. Uh, Russell Wilson was a late-round pick. He, or he wasn't a first-round pick at all. i um, trying to think of other quarterbacks in the league. I mean, that's yeah, you know, if you think about, like, Mason ahead. Rudolphs and stuff like that, I mean, those guys, it doesn't really matter. But, I mean, you got Herbert, obviously, was a first-round pick. I mean, Jimmy G was a second-round pick when he was starting. So... A vast majority of guys, I think, are more in the first round realm, but there are guys that you have or we have missed on that have worked themselves sure. up. And Russell Wilson kind of came out of nowhere, small, nobody thought he could play, and just ripped the Seahawks job away from Matt Flynn. Remember him? Matt yeah. Flynn, who got yeah. a big contract for two games at the end of a season and couldn't even win his starting job because that's how good Russell Wilson was and actually how bad Russell Wilson wanted it, if I'm being fair. I had a Matt Flynn Seahawks jersey. And All right. The, re the reason for that is I was in a bowling league with some buddies, and it was an NFL themed league, and you had to pick a franchise that was going to be a team that would be your team, and there could only be one of each team. And I think that we settled on the Seahawks because every other team that one of us was a fan of was taken. Uh, so you had to select what jersey. I'm like, who's their quarterback? And I was like, oh, it's, and I was like, Matt Flynn. And one of my buddies like, no, Russell Wilson's going to be the starter there. And I was like, whatever, like, Matt, you know. So, yeah, I had a Matt Flynn Seahawks jersey. That was like my, my one uh, Matt Flynn connection. Well, Russell Wilson's fascinating because he was one of the first quarterbacks to do what is is happening, co is commonplace now. Remember, he went from, where did he play before he was at NC State? He went, played at NC State for a year before he actually got drafted. Well, no, he went from NC State to Wisconsin. Oh, that's right. Okay. So, yeah, he was at NC State, then he went to Wisconsin. So, either way, it happened. He went and played, like, one season, did the Jalen Hurts thing, which wasn't very common 10 years ago. I mean, this was still, what, 2012, something like that, or 2011? So, this is a, a long ways away from what we know now as the transfer portal where you got a guy like Bo Nix who can go play five years at, at Auburn and start for five years at Auburn and then start for two years at Oregon – doesn't have it didn't happen that way so fascinating but I think you have missed an opportunity to wear a Matt Flynn jersey as often as you possibly can to show your ignorance as the podcasting host that you are. <laughs> That's right. I don't. I it's gone now. I have no. I might be oh. in my, my mom and stepdad's house somewhere. Possibly put it in your background when you build your podcast studio. Just put the Matt Flynn jersey right up here because he represents getting paid for doing basically nothing, which is kind of what we're hoping for. Yeah, I'll put my Matt Flynn jersey up next to my my old high school jersey that I have, Excellent. and it could just be two two great athletes that underperformed and are now irrelevant. Yes, but guess what? You played, so according to a lot of these people out there who are criticizing uh, a lot of these female pundits, they they didn't play. 
you played. You know more because you played, damn it. That doesn't mean anything, man. Like, <laughs> I mean, because right, Belichick like didn't really play at a high level, right? I mean, there's a lot of great coaches that didn't play at a super high level and whatever. But yeah, a lot of that stuff's so ignorant. It is very ignorant. But I just feel like Dan Campbell and the Lions are a team of destiny. But I've been wrong about that before. And I think America is rooting for Detroit, no doubt. But boy, wouldn't it be funny if we had a Lions Chief Super Bowl? You could have Eminem in the booth. You could have Taylor Swift in the booth. And the prop bets would be amazing how many times they show it. I, if if the Chiefs actually do win this game and Taylor Swift is at the Super Bowl, I may be placing some prop bets because there's going to be some real good ones about how often they show Taylor Swift, how often her name is is said. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun.